Good morning, ladies, and welcome to this week's installment of Tar with a Takeaway. I thought I would entitle today's class, Being Unique. We find the, um, there, there's a lot of things. I've gone through this parcha. I really have to struggle because I've covered this parcha from many angles over the years, and I had to try to find things that I've never said, and I did find them. And it was, it was actually more work than I thought it was going to be. But in any case, I'm going to bring some, first we're going to start out with some tidbits from this Parsha, and then we'll get into some bigger messages and hopefully life-changing lessons. This Parsha, basically, the Ramban tells us famously that this week's Parsha teaches us how to deal with the non-Jewish or secular world around us. The Ramban brings down a medrash that Rav Yanai, who was one of the um, Tanaim, that uh, he would, he would um, whenever he'd have to have dealings in Rome, he would learn Parshas by Yishlach before he would do so. So let's learn a part. Now, uh, we've done in the past, the three main struggles in this week's Parsh we did last year, in fact, three struggles of y uh, Yaakov, which was with the angel when they were fighting, you know, the angel of, of Esav, the Malach of Esav. We also find the struggle with Dina, the, that we've gone into that in great detail. And we also find that there's a struggle of, um, well, Yesav comes to Yaakov with 400 men and how Yaakov deals with it. And we mentioned that it's instructive, first of all, how a Jew behaves, that just saying just really just headlines here because we've gone into all this. I want to bring out some other points. But one big headline I did want to mention with Yaakov's dealing with Esav that we have to learn as Jews is that to make all these major demonstrations and how could you and all this kind of stuff. That's not the Jewish way. Yaakov bowed down to Esau seven times, no less. And the Zohar HaKadosh tells us he was bowing down to the Shekhinah. And Rav Dessler tells us that a Jew, the reason why he bowed down to Esau, you'd think like, what do you have to bow down to Esau for? Who's really superior? And that's just it. Just like we would tell a two-year-old, give in to your brother, you know, he's only a baby. You know, you're a big girl. You don't have to have the toy for, he'll, he won't use it forever. The same thing, we're not on the same playing field with Asaph. So by giving in to Asaph, we're not really giving in. It's really not a giving in. It's in fact saying I'm bigger than you, so I can give in. That's really what we're, what we're saying here. Okay. Now, so the, you know, that's, that's, that's one thing. And we talked about the struggle with the angel and, and, and like, uh, and whatever. And we also talked about Dina, which is a whole other talk, but here in this week's Parsha, um, the Ramban tells us several things. This is, this part is brought to you by Revolba Zetzal in his Sefer, Shirei Chumash. Um, Revolba says that it brings out the Ramban that Yaakov did not depend on his righteousness and he made Full hishtadlus. He made full efforts to, you know, to try to spare his family. When it comes to certain things in life, we are supposed to try our best. Now, of course, the outcome has nothing to do with us. Hashem can run his world without us quite easily, believe it or not, you know. <laughs> but we are supposed to put in our full efforts, and that's what's expected of us. And then it says at the end, he'd still a kadosh baruch was avadav v'goalo miad chazak mimenu. And at the end, Hashem saves him from even people that are ad adversaries that are greater than him, because Hashem can really do it all, but we have to make full efforts. Now, there's many reasons why Yaakov did not want to depend on his efforts. I'm sorry, I'm getting a phone call that cannot turn off. Um, the, re the, reason why, um, the reason why we're supposed to pull in full efforts is because if we depend on miracles, we're really saying that we're worthy of it. It can lead to tremendous arrogance. And with arrogance, you don't have any merits anymore to be able to depend on Hashem. People have to try. If it's a question of Shaduchim, if it's a question of health, we have to make efforts, whatever makes sense to us, of course. Of course, at the same time, with full knowledge that it's not our efforts, but we're supposed to make efforts, especially for very important things in life, that Hashem runs the show. Now, there's other people that feel not to make any efforts in Shaduchim, that's a different shita, and I'm not going according to that shita right now. But in any case, um, the Ramban also says that um, Yaakov, on one, it's a very interesting complexity here with Yaakov. On one hand, it says we learned the whole parsha how to deal with the outside world from Yaakov. And yet, on this, at the same token, we are told that there was a complaint against Yaakov who, tried, who did too much dealings with Esau. 
He should have let it aside, like Ace of do what he wants to do, not make so many efforts to make peace with him because he should have realized that we're dealing with an adversary here and he could be influenced. And he brings down, the Ramban says that um, in Bayez Shani, in the Second Temple period, there were Jewish kings that made ended up making peace with the Romans, which ultimately led to the destruction of the Second Temple. Sometimes when we deal, this is the lesson that Revolver brings down, we have to be wary, and we're going to be bringing it down more from Rav Nassim Vachvogel soon, that um, we have to be wary when we're dealing with the outside world uh, with influence. What influence can they have on us? Um, also, Havram Avina was taken to task. He asked great Torah scholars to help him fight the four kings and the five kings. And because of that, Avram Avinu brought down the Jews having to go to Mitzrayim. Now, on one hand, we're told we have to learn everything from our forefathers. On the other hand, they're, they always make these mistakes that they're taken to task and terrible catastrophes happen because one of our forefathers did something wrong. So Revolba says it's not a contradiction. On one hand, we have to understand we still feel this Parsha is instructive to us how to behave ourselves in exile. On the other hand, even though it's instructive to ourselves how to behave in exile, for them, it was it was too much effort. For us, it's not too much effort, but for them, it was. And that's how we're supposed to understand it. Person, it, it, you know, as I said, we have to do some efforts. Person thinks they're beyond efforts, then they think they're too great. They don't need effort. We have to make effort. But when it comes to dealing with non-Jews, at the same time, we have to be afraid of the influence they could have upon us. He meets up with Asaph and he tells them, I'm loving Garti. I lived with, with uh, Lovin. Now Rashi says, Vitariag Mitzvah Shamarti. <coughs> Garti is the same, um, uh, how do you say, it? the word Garti, I lived with Lovin, has the same, um, how do you say, uh, the count of words. Um, I can't think, Gematria, as Taryag, is 613. Why is it when Yaakov met up with Asaph that he is to, what is does Asaph care that he kept all 613 mitzvahs when he was at Lovin's house? So, <clears throat> Rashi brings down, he didn't learn from his bad deeds. What's the, what's the lesson? This is all Revolba, I'm bringing down his great ideas on this. He said that I was like a ger, garti, to live with somebody, there's many expressions in the Torah how to say to live with someone. To be a ger means to be a stranger. I want you to know, he's saying really to affect himself. I am not affected by the outside world. I am not letting it influence my Torah principles. I have Torah principles of how I want to lead my life, and I'm not allowing the outside world to have an effect on me. Now, the... Um, the idea is that also he's telling Lovin, he's telling Asa rather, you know what? They were fighting since they were in the womb of their mother. They're fighting Yaakov and Asa. And Yaakov was fighting at the end. Yaakov said, I just want the next world. I want the world to come. And Asa said, I want this world. I don't want to have to wait to get the next world. Yaakov's telling him, you know what? You see, it didn't become important. I lived with Lovin. I was mistreated, in fact. And I, Garti, I myself had strength. I was independent of him. And I'm just focusing on my Olam Haba. That's all I care about, says Yaakov. Revolva mentions that he lived for a good many years in Sweden during World War II. He, he escaped. And he said they had some peculiar holidays in Sweden. One holiday was that on the 20th of December, they would roast a pig and everybody would dance around it. And also in the longest summer day, they would dance around trees to show how much they love nature. And he said, you get caught, you got caught up in it and you couldn't imagine how much you could be influenced by such a situation, you know? And we don't realize like Americans, when it comes to Thanksgiving, people get nostalgic about the turkey or whatever, or the baseball games, the World Series, how many Bahram are, are, you know, have such a hard time during World Series, you know, concentrating on their learning, knowing that there's a World Series going on. Look how much we're affected by our countries. How many German Jews are punctual? I went, to, I used to go, I went to Breuer Seminary, which was in the in Washington Heights, New York, where they had German Jewish people of the German Jewish descent. When they had a shear, believe me, they started to the second. When it started, everybody there was five minutes early, you know, <laughs> because they, you know, that's German influence. 
There's good things we can learn from any country we've been in. There's no question about it. But there's also negative things, and we have to be able to adhere to our Torah principles. If there's something good we can learn from the country that can enhance our Torah, uh, then fine, wonderful. You know, um, Rabbi Yisrael Salanter said about the Germans, Bruchim heim ha-Ashkenazim, bishvil seder shalahem. He said, blessed be the Ashkenazim because they have so much organization. You know, he felt this was a big boom for Torah Jews if they could learn to be punctual, like Hashem makes the sun set exactly to the moment every day. If people could be punctual for things, how great would we be with keeping Shabbos, keeping Zmane Tfila? You know, I mean, for a woman, you have to, people are also important, but, you know, we, that that trumps often time, for, uh, time zones and things like that. But at the same time, there is a very big merit of doing things on time and being organized. And it's it's a very big thing. And that, that can be gained from living in a certain situation. Now, so Yaakov said, I'm Lavin It was like a stranger. I live with Lavin. I did not get influence. That's what he felt he had to mention because he felt uh, he brings that's from the Marali brings this down. I, I didn't become a, a minister. All I had was for Olam Haba. And look, I stuck to my quest. Now, when Yaakov meets with Esav, he prepares himself in three ways. Tefillah, Doron, and Milchama. Prayer, giving a present, and war. And Revolva says some very interesting things about each one of them. Let's take the present part first. This is written, I didn't look at the date of the publication of this safer, but it's a good, I would say, 15, 20 years ago, this safer came out. And he didn't, he passed away before then. He passed away a good, I would say, 20 years ago, Revolva. So that's all. Anyways, he said in those days, one of the Jewish ways we learned from the Chumash is that when you deal with foreign governments, you have to schmear them. You have to give them some type of uh, incentive, let's call it, for them to help the Jewish populace. This was time-honored custom from the time of Yaakov Avinu. We learned it from Yaakov Avinu. He said, since the <laughs> beginnings of the Jewish state, People felt too proud. We're not going to give the Palestinians. This is what he says about Palestinians. We didn't. We won't give them bribes. We're too big for that. We don't want to look like we have to lower ourselves. And he says, and he feels a lot of problems occurred because we didn't uh, treat them the way we should have been would treat them as we did all many other nationalities when Jews lived in foreign countries. Had we bribed them and given them presents and things like that, perhaps we'd have got done better with them than we did today. That's what he says. Tefillah. Now, whenever endeavor takes place, like let's say a person takes a medication, there's a thing in the Gemara that says, Yihiratzon ata. person should say this every time they take medicine or every time they're about to have a tipul, every time they're supposed to have something done to them, not to forget this, even though it's not a bracha, it's not a, you know, derisa or derabanan. People can say this in English too. Just talk to Hashem when you're taking something. Don't leave it just as a as you just do your you take care of your health and that's it. But we have to bring Hashem into the quote in the into the quotient in order to to make it effective. We have to have Hashem with us. We have to remember we're not just some, doing something independent and and all of a sudden now that I'm sick, God forbid, that Hashem is not here. You know, Hashem is here at all times, and we have to adjust ourselves accordingly. When, when, um, when Yaakov sent his sons down to Mitzrayim, he told them to bring from the bounty of, the, of, of Eretz Yisrael down to Paro to, you know, as a thanksgiving for what he did. But at the same time, he said, And you should daven to Hashem, that he should give you mercy. And I am davening for you that Hashem should give you mercy. Not enough to just give a present, but you have to have a tefillah with it. And this is how we're supposed to deal with the, the secular world. And then Milchama. That a person on one hand is giving a gift, on the other hand, be prepared. You don't know how this is going to turn out. Be prepared. Be cautious that many times uh, something could go wrong. And this, and and he's also told though it says um, the Ramban brings down about that that there will always be a pleita. The reason why Yaakov told him to do these three things, they said that there will always be a remnant of the Jewish people forever. The Ramban says way back in the 1500s. There's always going to be a remnant of the Jewish people that's existing. There'll always be a place to go. And there'll always be a country that'll be a benefactor for us, although another country has been cruel to us. So we found this so many times. Jews always had where to run. 
Even though one country rejected us, another country accepted us. And we always had, and this is what we, these are some of the things we learned from Yaakov. Then there's one other thing I wanted to bring out. I've mentioned this in the past. I don't remember when I mentioned, last mentioned it, but I just think it's an important principle, especially with the society that we live in today. It says in this week's Parsha, Shlomo Karabach says it also, Vayavasar Yaakov Levado. Yaakov went alone. Before he met up with the Malach of Esav, he went alone. Why did he go alone? So we're told, Pachim Ketanim. There were small vessels, small jugs that he had to fetch. He, he left behind. And so he left the whole camp to do, go, go back to get those vessels. Now we have to understand that Yaakov was a very wealthy individual. We're talking about measly few jugs, jugs like some jars, right? Um, you know, but Revolva brings down, I've heard this from many of the Bali Musser, it's a Torah principle, that the way we are to view anything we own is not that we are the owners of something, be it property, be it China, be it whatever it is that we own, silverware, whatever it is that we own in our homes, we are not the owners. It was given to us. It's Hashem who owns the whole world. He made us the, the, the keepers of these possessions. And when you are a keeper of a possession, you have to guard it properly. People think it's mine. I could just throw it out or misuse it or abuse it. We are supposed to take good care of everything we own. And mikan l'sadikim shechaviv aleyam mamonam yoser migufam. We learn from this that a tzaddik loves his possessions more than he does himself. Because a tzaddik feels when he owns something, this is God's gift to him. God gave him something. He, benef he benevolently bestowed upon him something. And um, he even, you know, endangered his life to go back to get these pachem ketanim. Even it says when Yocheved made Moshe's basket, she used guma. The, a guma type of um, sticks, and she didn't use arazim. She didn't use cedar wood to put her baby in because she was economical and careful. Like she she didn't want to squander money on something. People should be careful how they spend their money and how they <clears throat> how they use whatever they use, you know, as far as using leftover. I mean, yeah, some people throw out leftovers today or whether it's disposable dishes or whatever it is, we have to have in mind that everything is something God gave us and we have to take good care of it. And also our bodies, of course. <clears throat> the Vilna Gon says that it's a lack of amuna if you don't take care of what God has given you. Bahashkacha. One time, Rav Yerucham Levavet Zetzal, the, the famous mashkiach from the Mir, he got a cold because he was running on, he was on a freight train or a, not a, a regular train and he left behind a parcel in another cabin and it was a cheap parcel, whatever it was, something small. He ran from one car to the other car and you know, he had to go outside to get from one train car to the other. He went out and they went back and they, he went back and forth a few times because he didn't remember which car he had put it in. He went back and forth a few times and he got cold because of it and he got sick, but he felt it was worth it if there's something that God gave, gave you, you have to take good care of it. You know, for Simcha Zizel had a coat after the Altafin Kelm, after he was buried, they were looking at his clothing and the coat he wore every day since he was married looked like it was brand new. To that degree, he took care of his property. So, so far we talk about that a person has to employ efforts to do things. At the same time, of course, you have to know your efforts mean nothing, but you have to do it. And of course, if a person's in a dangerous situation, then you have to just have pure amuna, a bitachem. If a person's like in a point, you did your best, now you can't do any better, that's it, it's over. You did your best, it's over. Don't, don't rely on miracles. Also, the tefillah, doron, and melchama, how important prayer is to this process. How important it is sometimes to give a little gift, you never know where it'll take you. And at the same time, simultaneously be prepared for some type of confrontation, you never know, be prepared in your life. And we have to value our property. Now, we're going to continue. We're going to talk from Rav Nassim Vachvogel, who was the famous mashkiach of Lakewood Yeshiva with Rav Aaron Cutler. So it was just his yard site, I believe, last a few weeks ago, two weeks ago. And he talks about in this week's parsha, Yaakov was very afraid 
he was very afraid. And um, Yaakov Ma'od, Lo, He's very afraid your Asa was coming. He split the camp in two because there's more chance that one side will survive in case. And he was very afraid. Because he's afraid that he's going to kill someone. He's got afraid he could be killed. So uh, I, I heard many people say he's more afraid that he could hurt someone because he didn't want to hurt anyone unnecessarily because that's a, bla a, a red mark on his. You know, he doesn't want to hurt somebody if you don't have to. It should. It's a way of tzaddikim not to cause any harm to anybody. But why was he afraid? Because really what happened was it said he sent malachim and Rashi said they were actually, actual malachim. He sent to Esav. And the Medrash tells us that these malachim, they came and they, they the, the, as Esav's uh, agents approached, these malachim came to the agents and they told them, um, who are you? And they said, we're here with Esav. No, no, sorry, we're going to, let's hit them. And then then, then they said, no, no, we're the, we're the children of, uh, we're the grandchildren of Avraham. They said, it's not good enough. We'll hit them. And I said, we're the, we're the, we are the actual, Esav's the child of Esav. I mean, of um, Yitzchak. He's not just a grandson of Avram. He's a child of Esav. I mean, of Yitzchak. Boy. And then, and then they said, no, we'll still hit them. And as soon as he said, Yaakov's his brother, they said, all right, Mishalano Atem, you're, you're with us. Now, if he had a legion of angels protecting him, how could he be so afraid? So we're told in Vayikra, Says Rav Nassim Vachbogel, the Avdil Eschem Minha Mim Lios Li. I will separate you, Jewish people. You're supposed to be unique to me. I'm separating you to be for me. And Rashi says, Imatem Muvdalim Mehem. If you separate yourselves from them, Hareyatem Shali. You're mine. The love, but if you don't separate yourselves from them, Hareyatem Shal Nevuchad Netzar Vachaverav. Then your friend. Then you're going to be a, so you're under their dominion. We talked about this with Rachel, why she sat on the trophim. We said this in last week's Parsha. When you diminish something, then you're showing that only Hashem rules over my life. And when you, in fact, trust something else, you're putting it under that dominion. So here we see the whole case again. The Medrash says that um, when the Rav Hanina, Mishol, and Azaria made an idol, I mean, we're told to make an idol by Nebuchadnezzar, um, he told them, listen to me, I'm the king. And they said, the Medrash, we don't have to listen to you for the king about idolatry. We don't have to bow down to you. Being the king means you have our taxes. That's what being the king means. We don't have to bow down to anyone but Hashem. That's what they told him when, he, when they confronted them. And he says, but it says in Yermiel Chav Zion that, uh, that uh, eventually that Nebuchadnezzar will, be, will rule over all of you. Yermio predicted that Nebuchadnezzar will rule over all of you. And they said, if you're Nebuchadnezzar, then you're a dog, and no dog is better than you. If you're the king, we owe you allegiance with taxes. So they had the audacity to get up in front of Nebuchadnezzar and call him a dog. He's a man that ruled over the whole world. Now, it's not in general that you're supposed to refer to kings as dogs. We don't do that. Even though Esther Amalk and Tehillim says, you know, in, in, in Kaylee Kaylee and that Mismore, um, Esther Amalka says, you know, if, if a caliph is going to bother me, she was upset that she only called Ahasuerus a caliph, and she later changes it to Aryeh, that no, I'm I, I'm under the guide of, of an Ari, because you're supposed to give respect to the Malchus, but when he claims he's God, that was it for them. That far they're not going to go, and they were, and because of that, he threw them into the fiery furnace, and they were spared, because they put their faith in Hashem, Hashem came through for them. Had they put their faith in Nebuchadnezzar, then they would have been sitting ducks, literally, because they could have been destroyed. Now, Esav was trying his whole life to try to persuade Yaakov, come with me, come with me. Even this, this, this time that they meet each other, he says, I'll accompany you. I'll send people to accompany you. And he says, no, we walk so slowly. Meaning the way of a Jew is not to push fate. We do our effort, but Hashem brings the fate, so we don't push it. We just sit back and we take our time. That's how a Jew is. Jews don't rush. And I have my children, it's going to take me so long, but eventually we'll come to Seir, because later Hashem is going to come to Seir. And then, you know, so not, we're not going with you right now. 
Yaakov was avoiding his confrontation with Esau. He didn't want the influence to be over him. He wanted to be Hashem, under Hashem's influence, to be different from Esau. Abdil Eschemina Amim, Leos Lee. He wanted to be Mugdalim. He wanted to be under the Shlita of Hashem and not under the Shlita of Nebuchadnezzar. Also by, by Lavan, the same thing. Why couldn't Yaakov just have told Lavan for, 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 in the beginning, we're leaving now, we have to leave. Say goodbye to your father-in-law. You were living there for so many years. At least say goodbye. But he was so concerned, um, Yaakov, that even a goodbye would be influenced by Lavan. He couldn't do that. Lavan would make them a goodbye party. And Lavan, in fact, does say, uh, I will send you out I'll send you out with all kinds of musical accompaniment it even have a chance to kiss my children and grandchildren it sounds very cruel from Yaakov's part but he felt one more minute he's going to be under the influence one more minute he didn't want that influence so that's why they said they had to be snuck out because if they make a sudas preda they're going to be already influenced by him I heard once from the Chidushi Harim, the one of the first, the first Gera Rebbe, that he mentions that if you look at the Pasuk where it talks about love and saying, why didn't you tell me I would have sent you out with a with musical accompaniment? There are dots over those words. If you look at the Chumash and the Sefer Torah, you'll see there's dots over those words. And he says the Torah is saying something. It's not an exaggeration. He felt maybe music if you listen to music that doesn't enhance your judaism music that's you know very um provocative and uh, you know that could cause all kinds of feelings and emotions that aren't jewish to evoke things he could conquer the jewish people with music that would be improper and one more minute we find that whole example also by what's by um yosef and the wife of potiphar because Yosef ran away from her. She grabbed him the back of his cloak and she had now evidence against Yosef. Why didn't he go back and grab the cloak out of her hand? Because he was afraid one more minute with Aishas Potiphar, who knows what could be with me? You know, we have to be afraid of the influence. We have to try to separate ourselves from the other nations of the world. So we shouldn't be influenced by them. And, you know, especially now, there's a lot of people that are maybe coming out as friends of Jews, but we're still different. And we have other Jewish people too as well, you know, but they have other ideologies. There were many Rabbanim that were speaking, you know, some Rabbanim felt the Jews shouldn't go to that whole gathering that took place a few weeks ago in Washington, D.C., because they were afraid once you make an umbrella with the Orthodox and the conservative and the reform, people can start feeling, hey, you know, we're all, we all are together. There's no question, but there's certain things we can't give into. You know, in fact, they were worried, you know, the Kol Isha or all kinds of other things like the women singing there could be a problem or whatever. Not that we don't stand with our brothers. We do. But we have to make sure that the Torah is our influence and not other types of ideologies. And this is something it's not because we're we're afraid that we're so frail, that our, our philosophies are so frail that they could be easily influenced. It's because we have to there's something anyone could be influenced. Dina was uh, influenced by the, the, the daughter of Yaakov Avinu, Rebax Tzatzals tells us, Dina, the daughter of Yaakov Avinu was influenced by the words of Shechem. Unbelievable that she didn't want to leave the house. You know, and we're talking about, you know, look at the contrast, the two homes of Shechem and of Yaakov Avinu. Like, then he went, so what's the, but a person through words, and Rebax once said he went into a store and the guy was showing him the garments, a uh, suit store. And he said he was, by the time he left, he bought a suit. He didn't even want to buy a suit when he came in because the guy was like with all the words and the, the, the gestures. And people, there's a lot of influences we have out there. There's a lot of, uh, you know, and the propaganda we have of the internet and social media and everything influencing us. What influences us? We have to be, be aware of that and we have to deal with it. This helps to explain, says Rav Nassim, why the Hashvonaim, why the, the Maccabees decided to start up with the huge Syrian Greek army. They fulfilled the maxim of, if you're separated, you're mine. They felt, if they say, look, oh, so what is 10,000 Syrian Greeks to us? Hashem could do anything. They were on that level of trust in God. And once you're there, you're saved. You can really believe that. As long as you're not afraid of the other, 
as long as you're not afraid of the other, then you're not influenced by the other. As long as that other side doesn't persuade you, either with fear or with, with enticement, then you are really a free person and you're not. They were spared. And that's the same thing with Shimon and Levi. They didn't care. If they felt something was disgraced. They got up there and killed the whole, the two people got up and killed the whole city because they felt they, that, didn't, that didn't challenge them. Their, their beliefs withstood all. And we have exactly, but, uh, you know, sometimes people don't mention a lot of the Midrashim that we have about Hanukkah. And here's some things that people know generally about. I don't know if everybody knows everything, but he brings this down. So I thought I'd bring it down this time. I was I was hesitant to bring it down in years past, but I guess this time I'm going to share it with you. It says like for three years, there was a gazera. There was a decree on the Jews that all doors had to be torn off the hinges in Jewish homes in the Greek empire. Um, that's quite a gazera because being, you know, idea of Yehud, not just men and women, but everybody, like you get to, when you're alone with somebody, you get to have a certain connection that you wouldn't have otherwise. But especially with men, husbands and wives, you're not having any privacy in your homes. For three years, the Jews had to endure this and nobody sinned in any way during those three years. Then that they saw that wasn't working, they made the Jews all write down if they had any oxen or, or um, sheep, anything with a horn, they had to write down on that the, the, the horns of the animal that I have no portion in the God of Israel. Um, you know, you know, no Jew, no Jew transgressed that either. Not one Jew had the audacity to write that on the carne shore, on the, the, the horns of the oxen or whatever other animals would have, like a ram would have like that kind of horn. Um now, but in order not to, 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 you know, they said if you own a sheep, a sheep or, a, or a cow that has horns, you'd have to write that. So all the Jews at that time in the Syrian Greek Empire sold all their cattle and sheep, and they had no meat or milk products for all those times. And uh, and they couldn't plow their fields either because they didn't have cows with horns, the the male, you know, the bulls to 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 pull their sheep. They also gave them us uh, called Chamesh. There were three de main decrees against the Jews. Chodesh, they couldn't have Rosh Chodesh because Rosh Chodesh is what makes us unique. That a Jew is allowed to establish the times of the holidays. A Jewish based in the power. We have to believe our philos have power. We have to believe that we have power in what we do. And that they were not allowed to do. They were not allowed to do Mila because bris Mila makes you look different from the secular world. And I think I've mentioned to you that we are told that um, today that the, a lot of Rabbanim have said that one thing we should strengthen ourselves in to, since this whole war has started is in learning the laws of Shabbos. Even though I'm sure most of the ladies here know a lot of laws of Shabbos, should review them. There are many um, groups that are having like online, everything you can learn laws of Shabbos or Pick up a book of Shabbos and read it at your Shabbos table for every Suda read a halacha of Shabbos, you know, because Shabbos is one thing that makes us unique. This is this, it makes us distinct. We find that, um, so what happened? Hashem made a miracle because we didn't rely on the Greeks and we didn't say, oh my God, the Greeks are telling us we have to do this. So Hashem, go to the corner somewhere. So we will write it down. We'll write it down. And we don't really mean it, but we're going to write it. It was a time of Shmad. You're not allowed to give up an iota when somebody wants to destroy your religion. Unlike the time of Haman when it was a national disaster, this was a religious disaster. So they wouldn't give up a fraction. So what happened? Hashem made a miracle because their windows and doors were all open. Birds flew in. Kosher birds flew in. And also animals like deer would rampage their house. And they said, oh, here's a good specimen. They shafted it. And they had meat. And they had milk. And they had all kinds of other things that they got because they didn't break either one of those decrees against them. At the very end, what really happened was that they saw those gazeros, those decrees weren't working. Remember, this whole story, I believe, was 52 years long. At the end, they said, OK, the next thing is every Jewish woman that gets married has to first sleep her wedding night with the hegbone, with the leader of the Greeks. That's how she has to spend her wedding night, first with him, and then she could go to her husband. What happened was Matis Yehu's daughter was getting married, and all the great sages came to her wedding, and she decided she had to make a statement, and she disrobed. 
She disrobed and got up there, and everyone's all these men need to command of that generation, the time of the base of Mikdash. Everyone was like, what is going on? Is like worse than than um the wife of Om Ben Pelis, who just took off her hair covering to get men shook up. She felt she had to make a statement. She said, This much you're disgracing your religion? Like you're gonna allow women to do this? And the, that caused the whole revolt was because of a Jewish woman said, when it comes to Tzniyas, modesty, which is the foundations of Judaism, you're going to go that far? You're going to make that happen? You're going to give in to the Greeks on this one? And she, and because of this, they began the whole revolt because of a Jewish woman who refused to, to, to compromise on her Tzniyas. That shows what Tzniyas is for Judaism. Like we can't, have to, we can't minimize it. Now we have our own equivalent today. I don't know, I found myself like people are very caught up with the hostages and they're all worried about the hostages and it's a big worry. They're our brethren, my heart bleeds for them. But we have to remember there is a God in heaven. And if we get too caught up, I mean, maybe just a little bit to hear the headlines and read the headlines, whatever it is, but to get too caught up in it, we forget that there's a God that's going to save us. And it, it makes us despondent. It makes us upset. It causes us to compromise halacha. It wastes our time. You know, like that, you know, the, um, and, 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 and this is something that we can really overcome. We have to remember, are we in the camp of this moment of all the, 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 the uh, social media? Are we under the, under the media's influence? Or are we under the influence of Hashem? That we believe Hashem is orchestrating everything, the negative and the positive. And we have to continue serving Hashem. We can't let these things be total distractions to our Vodas Hashem. In fact, they should enhance our Vodas Hashem. It should make us this for a time of trouble. Just like I heard Rav Shimshon Pincus' son, I don't know, his, I, I, I didn't take the time to write down his name, but he has a kolel somewhere in Yerushalayim. He said he happened to have passed by a house of Shiva last week. And, you know, there was Debach, somebody who goes, someone in this whole tragedy that died. And there were soldiers there. They were all crying and talking about what a wonderful man he was. And he said he went to the kolal afterwards and he told them there was such heroism, you know, that the soldiers have engaged on in that they were trying to save the Jewish people. What are we doing? We as Yidin, we have to comp we have to show some heroism in our avodas Hashem. That's where we can shine. It's our effort, just effort, because God is running the whole show anyways. We're powerless. Just like we see total open miracles that nobody, it's, Israeli army could be great, but it's not the Israeli army winning right now. It's Hashem, like every Jewish war. You know, these are miracles happening all around us. I'm going to tell you some at the end of this talk. There's many miracles occurring around us. And Hashem is running the show. We have to put in our effort. We as Jews have to realize that an ace sorrow when things are bad, not, not a lot, but we have to show that we're willing to give up, especially Hanukkah. That's what it's telling us. And it was the Jewish women on Hanukkah, Hanan and her seven sons. And we find the, the, the daughter of Matis Yahu and, and also the um, Yehudis. <laughs> she also ex you know, exemplified Mesiris Nefesh. These were women. We have our own way to do Mesiris Nefesh to do something a little bit hard for ourselves, like show something, some movement that we're going to do something difficult for ourselves because this is a time where Hashem is looking for our efforts. How much are you trying to be good Jews? The, uh, you know, the before, before Rav, Rav, he explains, Rav Nassim explains from the Ramchal, Rav Moshe Chaim Lutzato, who says, that before Chait Anamarishan, before Anamarishan sinned, there was a clear boundary between good and evil. And it's a long discussion. I don't want to get into it now because it's out of the scope. It's more for Parshas Parashas. But actually, after the sin, um, anything good has a little bit of bad mixed up with it. It's it is more of a confusion. Our Yetzar Atov and Hayetzar Ra are not as clearly uh, divided as they were before the sin. When you're on that madrega before the sin, you saw that evil was outside of you. Now evil is like inside. It's also part of us. It's more in, inner part of us than it was before the sin. So he said, you know, when Avram Avinu came along after 20 generations, he he was he was he turned everything totally around because he was willing to expend effort. Avram Ivri, 
He stood on one side. The whole world was into idolatry. He stood for monotheism. He said, you know, he, he exemplified going against the tide. And because of this, he was able to get clarity like Adam He was like Adam before the sin. The Jews in Egypt, three things they never did. They never changed their language. They never changed their garb. And they never changed... And they also, they never intermarried in any way, except this one woman, Shlomas Bastibri, which was against her will. But all the Jews were pure and chaste. And they were different than the Egyptians, who were very immoral. When we stand on the side of Hashem versus the tide, then we're under his jurisdiction and not under the jurisdiction of Nebuchadnezzar. And they say that when Melech HaMashiach will come, Bahaya Bayom HaHu Yitaka Bashaifar Gadol, when they blow that shofar, the Ovdim, Be'eretz Ashur, those are the people, Ovdim, Ashur means like a, a land of happiness, like the, the wealthy countries. Hanidachim, Be'eretz, means people living with very difficult conditions. They're all going to come back to Yerushalayim. They'll have a clarity, like there was the time of before, before Kedan and Marisham, and Mashiach is going to clarify the, the, the good um, versus the bad for us when Mashiach comes. Interesting thing is, Again, I'm not saying, I'm not here to condemn anyone and I'm not here to judge anyone. There's many thoughts up and high from Hashem as to why things took place. But most of the people in the kibbutzim that were affected by this whole horrible massacre were people that actually wanted peace for the Palestinians. They had written all over their walls. They wanted peace for the Palestinians. They were living near them in Gaza because they felt these are people, just the right education, the right this, the right that, the everything will be fine and dandy if we just make peace with them. But the point is that when we realize that we have a different entity, Ju Judaism is a different entity, the obvious time, we're supposed to be separate, we're supposed to be different, unique. And when we are willing to expend energy to show our uniqueness, this is what saves us from all the other people. I just heard a story from a Rav who talked about somebody named Hai Sharab Shabi. Hai Shabi was a Jew. They were in a kibbutz Be'eri, I believe, which was highly hit by the massacre. And there were like, in his area, there were just one, uh, was homes, one floor bungalow homes. And there were nice homes. And they were very, very terribly hit by the, uh, by the Hamas murderers. They, um, there was like a family that was from there, a woman and a child that kept everything. And this Hai Sharabi was a person trying to improve his Judaism. He kept a lot of things. And on this, and this year, he decided he was going to keep um, sukkahs. He was going to build a sukkah. And um, on the day of October 7th, uh, they were they were coming in. He heard them approaching. They had a dog, and the dog was barking. That these they, you know dog barks when they see there's intruders, and they shot the dog twice. And then someone said, "Stop!" The dog was howling, and then they shot it four times. The dog died. So they all ran in, of course, to the safe room, the the mat, and they were hiding out there. And he said he was holding onto the door handle with all his might because didn't have a lock. And they're trying the door and he's holding and, and somehow the door is holding. And um, at some point he said, he, he just, you know, like he kept crying out to God to help them. And they were like shivering that they, you know, they burst into his home. And he said, after they left his room alone, he smelled coffee brewing. They were making Turkish coffee in his house, in his, in his house. And he heard them smoke, he smelled cigarettes. They were smoking cigarettes and going back and forth, running through his house. They tried the door again. They even shot at the door, but accidentally they hit the handle and now he was locked in the room. He was locked in his room and uh, they couldn't, they, he didn't have to hold the door anymore because it was totally locked. He didn't know what to do. So they decided through the air conditioner duct, they made a fire and they were gonna, you know, totally choke them, strangle them. So there's this black smoke coming in through the room. He sees it with his wife and his twin daughters, and he doesn't know what to do. He's to, at one point, he says, I'm just going to face them. I'm going to go out of the room. And he's trying the door, and the door is not opening. He doesn't know what to do. And they're one flight up. So he decided he climbed out of his window. He, he opened the window. He decided that's the only way to go. I don't know if it's going to kill us or save us, but I'm going to open the window. And he climbs out of the window, and then he had his wife throw his daughters out to him, and he caught both of them and his wife, 
And he said there was barely, they heard them, they were, he said within 30 centimeters of them, which is extremely close. He said they hid, they had a little teeny baby palm tree on their property. And he said they took the leaves and they hid under the palm tree. It barely hid them, but the enemy did not find them whatsoever. And he said this palm tree happened to be the one by which he used its leaves for schach, for his new sukkah that he took upon himself this year. And he said the palm tree, the schach of the same leaves that were used for, not the same leaves exactly, but the same tree that provided leaves for the sukkah is what saved him and his family's life. That's just one example. But we always are faced with a, a fight with the Yetzirah. Rabbi Victor Miller tells us, so that's how, that the, the, he was fighting the Esav's representative, the Saroshal Esav. They had it all night until the morning. He says, this represents a person throughout the generations has a fight with their Yetzirah the moment they're born till the moment they die. There's never a moment your Yetzirah isn't waiting in ambush for you. And there's different Yetzirahs. That's why the, the Malach said, I don't have a name. Don't ask my name. Because, every, you know, some years he says, what does he say? Some years it's feminism. That's what Rebecca Miller said. But there's a lot of, you know, if we always have different isms and different things getting in the way of us keeping pure Judaism. So, it even says, when Yaakov struggled with the angel, we have to understand something. This is a superhuman struggling with a human. Of course they could win us, but Hashem tailored the, our, the fight. He wanted it to be exactly the toughest Yaakov could be. That's all it, it couldn't do. God doesn't expect of us more than we can do. He just expects us to do our best. And he hit him in, one, in, 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 in a sensitive part in his hip because some of his children would be weak and they brought him down. But the idea is, that this test was, nobody else had fight for hours and hours. Even Hanani, Mishal, and Azaria were tested to jump into a furnace. That's not like all night fight, an all night struggle. And the idea is that the Yetzirah at the end, daybreak comes and the Yetzirah goes away. When Mashiach will come, we won't have the Yetzirah. Now, the three things we learned from a fight with the Yetzirah, says Ravigdor Miller, we learned from Kayan. Kayan was given a little tutelage from Hashem is what the Yitzhar represents. Once, it, first of all, we're told, the Fesa Chatas Rovates, it stands there crouching, waiting for you. You wake up in the morning, the Yitzhar is waiting. You go to sleep at night, it's waiting day and night. One time famous story, the Chavetz Chaim was an older man and he's, he, he didn't want to get out of bed for Minyan. And then he said, you know, he says, why should you bother get out of bed? And he said, Yetzirah, you're older than me. I got my Yetzirah Tov at 13. You were 13 years ahead of me. He says, you're older than me and you're fighting? Why can't I fight you back? So he got up out of bed because of that. The Nachash, says Rabbi, says Rabbi Victor Miller, he blends in with the background. A snake usually has camouflage to blend in with the background. Whatever generation it is, it's waiting, crouching, waiting to overcome us. Be it Paris designers, telling people, wear a skirt a little bit above your knee, so what? Or in the middle of your knee, you know, that's what's in, in Paris. You know, we can't be, we can't look different. We can't look like these old ladies. We have to look like with the times. He said the moon landing was such a big gate to horror. Everybody wanted to watch it. They went to their next door neighbor's televisions or their own television. He said, how many men were taken away from Torah study that night, that day, because they, because they had to see the moon landing. <coughs> Sports, how many people's minds are overcome? You know, all the God is manipulating all world events. Uh oh, did I just lose this? Oh, here we are. I don't know if you lost me, but I lost you for a moment. Um, another it says, but Elecha to Shukaso. Um, it's 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 focused. The Itzhar's focus is only on you to trap you, be it anything that goes on around us. This is the Yetzirah trying to fight us. Rabbi Yisrael Salanter says, when you do something good, you're going to get opposition right away. It's, it's a given because the Yitzhar is going to try to fight with this new thing. And as you get older, call a gadol mechaveru Yitzro gadol mimenu. It's a, it's a struggle we have our whole life. There's a bean in the Gemara called tumorous, a termus. A termus is a very bitter bean. And if you cook it, the water also becomes extremely bitter. You have to cook it seven times and strain out all the water, and it's del a delicacy. So too, this is what God wants, the struggle. 
We have to fight the Yetzirah. Now, it wins sometimes, but most of the times he brings down, Rav Nachman Breslov tells us that he fought his Yetzirah a hundred times and then finally he overcame it permanently. But a hundred times he lost until he overcame his Yetzirah. Hashem doesn't want the results, he wants the struggle because results are really up to Hashem. I was just listening to the Bitachan Hotline this week and there were two people that called in, a woman who had like a life-changing thing to, to, for Kiruv. She had all these recordings and writings and everything she put on the computer. She had a whole curriculum or something like that. And the whole thing was wiped out. There was no way to salvage it. And he said there was a Rebbe that wrote tons and tons of papers on the computer also had the same problem. They both called in and he told them both, look, what you accomplish is not up to you. Like we're so into accomplishments. Look how many sperm this one wrote, or look how many yeshivas, how big is this yeshiva? How many people are in the yeshiva? We're not here to, to uh, we're here to fight. And anybody can fight their own battles and their own privacy of their home. The accomplishments are up to Hashem. The way people's kids turn out, the way people's uh, yeshivas turn out, the way, look how many people that like, came from great uh, grandparents are not what their grandparents hoped for. You know what I mean? And, and we see other people that all of a sudden do tshuva because of a, a Zeta or Baba that daven for them. It's not what we accomplish because that would not be a fair test. Our test is, are we fighting our whole life, the Yetz Sahara? And he brings down that young Jewish mothers, they all can't wait till they're bubbies and they don't have to stay up all night with their kids. This one is a cold. This one is the flu. This one is this problem. He said a bubby could just go home and that's it. Hey, nice seeing you. Good night. You go home, you go to sleep. He said, but the struggle at night, this is your prime. This is when you're going to get reward for every moment that you gave to another person. Anytime we're fighting anything, anything we're fighting in our own lives, those are the things we get. So we see, Lefesa Chatas rebates that the Yesar is waiting for us always. And this is that we learn from Yaakov Avinu, not just na nationally, that we just have to be unique and separate, but we have to fight the fight. That's what we're here in the world for. He said not to conquer how much Torah we learned or how much mitzvahs we did. It's what fight, what effort did you expel? If it's found, this is, this is the Hashmonaim. It's the effort that counts. It's not what you do. This is the weakness. The Bach tells us in the days of the Hashmonaim, People were weak in the way they served Hashem in the base of Mikdash. They didn't put their whole kayak into it. They didn't try, like, you know, when we're doing a mitzvah, let's not give up. If there's somebody else that needs us on the other line, let's put our whole kayak into it. Let's Anytime we do any mitzvah, put our whole kayak into it. Some people are stronger with the Bein Anu Machavero. Some people are stronger with Bein Anu We're supposed to be strong in all of them. We have to work, expound effort. This is what we're here in the world for. But it says at the end, to Kayan, Hashem tells him, that you have the power to overcome the Yetzirah. And, it, you know, it says the Yetzirah is like night. When you don't see the results, you're just fighting. We celebrate accomplishments and values, but effort is really what counts. I just heard a story today of a, of a lady, two friends that used to be girlfriends in Lakewood. Or maybe I'm making a mistake. I know one lady lives in Lakewood, the other lady, I don't know where she lives. And they were childhood friends, and they both got married. Uh, no, the one I don't know. If the, I don't know if one got married, but one was not went off the derech. One was still her friend. She decided, you know what? I'm going to be with my friend no matter what. There's got to be a warm corner somewhere for her when she decides to return. So she was always every week or two she would call her friend, just check catch up on her, and just show her love and caring. Anyways, what happened was. You know, they kept it on for years. And then the friend decided, friend from Lakewood decided, you know what? I've got another, we have a good relationship. We're close. We keep up all the time. I've got to say something about mitzvah observance for her good. I want, I care about her olam haba. So she starts telling her, you know, how about keeping a Shabbos? Maybe one Shabbos, just try, just no, no Shabbos. She's again, how, you know, this time she tried many times. How about, you know, keeping a Shabbos? No, nothing. Finally, I don't know if it was this year or last year, she told her, how about Yom Kippur? She says, Yom Kippur, are you kidding? I, I, I should keep, I, I said no to Shabbos. I'm going to say yes to Yom Kippur. She said, listen, listen to me. She says, all you have to do is stay in bed the whole day and don't pick up the phone. Just stay in bed the whole day. You, you wouldn't have, just, you would have transgressed anything from the Torah. You wouldn't have transgressed anything. Just do that. Do that. 
And the girl tells her, okay, for you, because you're my good friend, I'll do it for you. So that, so that day she, she decided, I think it was this year, the girl kept, Yom Kippur, she hadn't kept in years. <coughs> what happened was during the morning, the phone was ringing and ringing and ringing and ringing and ringing. And she didn't answer because that was her promise to her friend. She's not going to pick up the phone. She's not going to eat and drink. Anyways, what happened is the, um, after the fast was over, uh, she saw her battery was dead. She was wondering who called me all day. So finally she charges the phone. She checks the messages. <coughs> she sees it was the bank. And the bank said, somebody's trying to take out a lot of money out of your account. And if we don't hear from you within 24 hours, or within, uh, I don't know, whatever it was, an hour, we are going to freeze your account. We're going to have to freeze it for your sake because we don't want someone exploiting your account. So we're expecting to hear back from you soon. Meanwhile, P.S., because of Yom Kippur, she missed the deadline. She checks her bank account online, and she sees, indeed, it's frozen. And she's really upset. She calls her friend up, and she said, I did what you wanted me to do. I kept Yom Kippur, and look, my money is frozen. I can't get my money out. What she didn't tell her friend was she had booked, she and a few friends were supposed to be booking a ticket to go to the festival that just took place on, on Simcha's Torah. She was going to go to Israel with three friends. They're all together going to go make a trip and go to this dance music festival together. And her account was frozen. And these type of friends that she had that weren't from, they weren't interested in lending her any money. So she missed out on the whole festival. But you know what happened at the festival, and because of her keeping Yom Kippur, she missed out on the other part of the festival that took place. And afterwards, after October 7th, she called her friend. She says, now I see that Yom Kippur saved my life. So let's remember when we struggle to keep any mitzvah, we have to be not in the sight of Nebuchadnezzar and his friends. We have to be in the camp of Hashem. And we decide to go in that direction. Hashem will give us. That's Hashem, only good things, which is what we're seeing. Full miracles for all the people that keep Hashem's mitzvahs. But that should not deter us from ex 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 putting out effort. We're approaching Hanukkah. When the whole Hanukkah started because of great effort, superhuman effort, we should try to not all across the board, we can't do, grab the whole world by its tail at once, but just try it once a day to put some extra effort into something that we're doing. Or if there's a mitzvah that we're neglectful with, Let's try to, to, to take on that mitzvah with more, to increase it and do it more often and do it with more passion because we think we're doing more, but really Hashem is putting us more under his wing and saving us. I thank you for listening and 